Well, this talk grew out of a, a book that I published a couple of years ago called The God Theory. And I'll be talking about consciousness having to do with this theory in the talk this afternoon. But it stems from the uh, discovery of the last oh, 20 years or so that our universe seems to be a very finely tuned place. I'm not going to go through these, these in any detail, but these are nine properties of the universe that pretty much today astrophysicists agree are rather remarkably finely tuned to make it possible for life to evolve in the universe. They are the ratio of the gravitational to the Coulomb force, strength of the nuclear force. If that one were 10 or 20 percent higher or lower than it is, we wouldn't have stars. A certain carbon resonance that allows carbon to form in the interiors of stars, which of course is necessary for life. The expansion property of water upon freezing. The fact that the neutron is slightly heavier than the proton and not the other way around. The average density of matter in the universe, the strength of the dark energy, quantum clumping, and the uh, slight prevalence of matter over antimatter when the universe formed. Now, all of these taken together could have been rather different than what they are, and if they were, we wouldn't be here, nor would other life be here. But they are rather finely tuned, and there are two explanations for this, which I'll talk about next. But first to mention that in current astrophysical theory, we think that the universe went through a tremendous period of inflation before it settled down into the rather slow expansion that we now called the Hubble expansion that is characterizing the universe. In the first 10 to the minus 34 seconds or thereabouts, and that's sort of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a millionth of a second, the universe expanded tremendously into uh, a region of, of, well, it became a region of space that led to the formation of our universe and perhaps even other universes. So the idea that there could be other universes forming out of this inflation um, function leads to the explanation that maybe our universe is not really special, it's only that there are lots and lots of other universes that came out of this inflationary period. In fact, there may be literally an infinite number of other universes that came out of this inflationary period, and therefore there must be a whole distribution, a whole ensemble of different laws and constants of nature that characterize these different universes, and ours is the one we happen to be able to live in. We wouldn't be in any of the others because we couldn't have arisen in them. And so this multiverse explanation for why our universe is finely tuned is the one that you'll find in mainstream astrophysics. And there are books out on this by, by people such as Sir Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, Leonard Susskind, the Stanford physicist, and one of the fathers of string theory. And it's a perfectly plausible explanation that we are not special. It's just that we are part of an ensemble of a huge, vast number of other universes that unfortunately we can never see, we can never directly detect, we can never measure. The other alternative, of course, the alternative is that there is an intelligence with a purpose behind the laws of nature. Not at all something having to do with intelligent design, by the way, but having to do with dreaming into existence the laws of nature and constants that would lead to a life-friendly universe. Not just life on Earth, I'm assuming, but presumably life on many other planets around lots of other stars and lots of other galaxies. In fact, even Sir Fred Hoyle, toward the end of his life, called the universe an obvious fix when he looked at the, uh, the properties of the universe. So I began to think about the notion that maybe the universe is the way it is because there is a conscious intelligence behind it, behind the, the origin of the universe. Uh, this is uh, Sir James Jeans, one of the, the prominent astrophysicists of the first half of the last century, and he wrote about this. He says, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We are beginning to think that we ought rather to hail it, that is, mind, as the creator and governor of the realm of matter. And so he was proposing that there is an intelligence behind the universe to make it be the, the sort of special place that we now we've really determined with uh, great precision that it appears to be. Another uh, brilliant astrophysicist from that same era is Sir Arthur Eddington, and here he is with Einstein. Eddington was the one who made Einstein famous. And you can see on the uh, left side the, um, the headlines. I seem to have lost the, uh, the point. Ah, oh, there it is. The headlines from the New York Times when the discovery was made that the, uh, the sun causes the bending of starlight during the eclipse of 1919. Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein theory triumphs. A book for 12 wise men. So this is what made Einstein famous, and it was Sir Arthur Eddington who led that e eclipse expedition to Principe in 1919 that made the observation. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington was a brilliant man, probably the predominant, the, the most prominent astrophysicist of the first half of the last century, and he wrote many books. Uh, one of them, The Mathematical Theory of Relativity, which was uh, the exposition of general relativity, the first textbook on that, which, by the way, I also used when I was a graduate student back in the 1970s and 1980s. The original edition came out in 1923. 
He was also the, the one who proposed the thermonuclear reactions as the basis for the, uh, the, the uh, energy of stars. A brilliant man. He also wrote, however, Science and the Unseen World, because he was also a mystic. He was a Quaker and a mystic. And he asked the question therein, are we in pursuing the mystical outlook, facing the hard facts of experience? Surely we are. And so he was not, uh, not ashamed to write about and talk about his view that, in fact, there's more to the reality, more to reality than simply the physical universe. Now, as it turns out, there is more reason than ever today to take seriously the notion that consciousness is not some epiphenomenal byproduct of life arising through evolution, but rather that consciousness is a primary, a primary formative element in the universe. That in fact, consciousness is the, the basis of the universe. This is another book that just came out a couple of years ago by a couple of uh, physicists at the University of California, Santa Cruz. In fact, one of them, Bruce Rosenblum, was the chair of the department. And what they've done is to write a book for undergraduates or anyone interested in the philosophy of quantum physics. The idea being that there are, the interpretation of quantum physics has now gotten us to the point where it's really necessary to invoke consciousness as the, the necessary ingredient to make reality happen, to shape reality at the quantum level. Consciousness is, is, is something you can't do without. Now, that's what I'm going to be talking about during the rest of the presentation. But let me give you a few quotes from the book. Quantum theory is the most stunningly successful theory in all of science. Not a single one of its predictions has ever been proven wrong. So quantum mechanics, quantum theory, really is a, a wonderfully valid, wonder, wonderfully robust theory. However, quantum experiments hint at a worldview that has not yet been grasped, the existence of something beyond what we usually consider physics beyond what we usually consider the physical world. And they wrote this sort of thing with, you can read in the books their trepidation at putting ideas like this out because they're afraid of being criticized by their colleagues for putting sort of new age, fuzzy, wuzzy kinds of notions out there that might confuse people into thinking that somehow physics proves that there's God. It doesn't, of course, and I'm not, I'm not about to say that in this lecture either. But what physics does do today at the quantum level, and therefore at all higher levels, I think, is to require that consciousness is a necessary element in creating reality at that, uh, in the measurement of things at the quantum phase. The other point they made, which I had not really appreciated, was that to really um, understand the philosophical implications of quantum physics, you don't have to be a physicist. You don't have to know the mathematics at all of quantum physics to appreciate the, the conundrum in quantum mechanics of requiring an observer with consciousness to actually make things happen. You can perfectly well engage in philosophical discussions of quantum physics by understanding quantum physics at a qualitative level. The, the operators, the, the, the Hilbert spaces, all of that, that's fine if you're going to manipulate uh, equations and you know, solve quantum problems, but in terms of understanding what quantum physics really implies philosophically, you don't need any of that. You can be an undergraduate having taken this course with some deep thinking about what it means and discuss with other people and with physicists what it all means with some level of credibility and with uh, you know, no, no less a deep understanding of what it means than if you can manipulate all the mathematics of quantum theory, which is quite formidable, which I've had some experience with uh, both positively and negatively. The quantum enigma. Quantum mechanics applies to everything. We can now manipulate individual atoms. And here's an example from 1989 already of a scanning, tunneling microscope image of the uh, IBM spelled out with individual atoms. Now, what's not widely realized is that an atom and its wave function are the same thing. It, you know, when I first started studying quantum physics, I thought that the, the wave function, which is the thing that, the fuzzy thing that describes sort of where you're going to find a particle when you make a measurement, that that wave function is something sort of over and above the particle, that it's there and the particle is sort of jostled around or somehow is spread out within this wave function. But it's the, actually the case that the wave function is the object. And when you collapse the wave function, you're causing the object to appear in a certain place. And it's not a separate thing at all. This is a very key aspect of quantum physics that's usually not appreciated even by people that, you know, get degrees in physics and are not necessarily quantum experts, you know, but that have spent quite a bit of time studying quantum physics, it's sometimes not really appreciated that the wave function is the same thing as the, the particle that ultimately comes out of a measurement. 
And because the, the atom and its wave function are the same thing, an atom can be in two places at once, or three or four, or actually an infinite number of places at once. The observation collapsing the wave function is what creates, literally creates, the atom. Now, um, let's give an example of the, the weirdness of a quantum measurement. Let's take, uh, this is a penny, and you can slice this penny two ways. You can slice the penny down the, uh, right down the middle, and you can get the Lincoln on the front and the memorial on the back. Or you could call this uh, thing chopping the penny in half, where you have the top half of the penny and the bottom half of the penny. So I'll call this a slice, and I'll call this a chop for the, uh, the experiment, the thought experiment. Assume we have a mutual friend called Niels. This, for fun, call him Niels. You might know why. We, we, he has two machines that slice, chop, and mail out pennies. One machine is labeled classical, and the other is labeled quantum. Now, when he sets the classical machine to slice, the cut is parallel through the penny, so that you wind up with two thin coins. One has Lincoln on one side, the other has Lincoln Memorial on, on the other side. When he sets the classical machine to chop, the chop is perpendicular to the penny, resulting in two half-moon-shaped half pennies, one with Lincoln's head, the other with Lincoln's shoulders. So now he takes the two sliced pennies, so the two, uh, the two sliced pennies on the top, he takes those, and puts one in an envelope labeled sliced pennies, and he mails one envelope to you and one to me. Now I, I open my envelope and I find a thin penny with Lincoln on it. So I can safely infer that your envelope contains a thin penny with the Lincoln, Lincoln Memorial on one side. And sure enough, when you open your envelope, you're going to see, if I have this in my envelope, you'll have that one. All right. Well, now my friend Niels takes the two chopped pennies and puts one in each envelope labeled chopped pennies. Again, he emails one to you and one to me. Now, I, I open my envelope and I find a penny with Lincoln's head in it. So this is what's in my penny. And sure enough, I guess that you're going to find the bottom half of the coin in yours, and that's indeed what you find. All right, no big mystery here, kind of boring. Now, one day I get an envelope with the word quantum written on it. And I figure this might be important, so I call Niels and I ask, um, Niels, what do I have? Do I have a sliced penny or a chopped penny? And he says, well, <clears throat> this time uh, I use the quantum machine on this one, not the classical machine, so it's your choice. I say, ah, uh, well, uh, what do you mean? You've already sliced or chopped the penny and mailed it to me. I've got it in my hands. How can I change that now? He says, well, the quantum machine is special. It processes a penny, and it mails out the pairs in unlabeled envelopes without anybody looking at the pennies. The process does not get turned into a slice or a chop until somebody looks at the coin. Uh, do you mean to say, I ask, that I can decide whether I've got a sliced penny or a chopped penny in the en that envelope, and magically I will get one or the other? That's correct, says Niels in Danish. And as soon as you open the envelope and look at whether you've got a sliced penny or a chopped penny, guess what? The other half, the correct other half, will be what your buddy over there is going to have in his envelope. Uh, but I say, it's already been sliced or chopped. He says, no, the quantum machine only does, that part of the, only does part of the job. It correlates the two halves, but it takes your consciousness to complete the process. You get to decide which way the penny has been halved when you open the envelope. Now, this very same thing can be done, of course, not with real pennies, but it can be done with, uh, with quantum objects, such as photons. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to talk about the Bell inequality and more importantly, a new inequality that you might never have heard of called the Leggett inequality that was recently measured. It was actually formulated almost 30 years ago by, uh, by uh, Professor Leggett, who was a Nobel Prize winner. But it wasn't tested until about a year and a half ago when an article appeared in Nature that a measurement was made by this prominent quantum optics group in, at the University of Vienna, read by, led by Anton Zeilinger, in which they measured the Leggett inequality, which actually goes a step deeper than the Bell one, and rules out any possible interpretation other than that consciousness creates reality when the measurement is made. Now, in the quantum enigma, of course, you don't have coins, but you have twin state photons that don't have any particular polarization until the polarization of one of them is measured. So twin state photons can be entangled in a state of identical polarization, but really have no particular polarization until you measure it. It's the observation of the polarization of one of the photons as being, say, vertical or horizontal that instantaneously collapses both photons to vertical polarizations. And that's true when they fly apart. You create a pair of photons. One flies this way, one flies that way. I make a measurement over here. That measurement 
and the kind of measurement I make is determined by what I decide over here, that measurement will then be reflected in what this coin over here is going to do, even though they're flying apart at the speed of light, can't communicate with each other. Quantum probability is not the probability of where the atom is, or where a photon is. It is the objective probability of where you will find it. The atom was not in the box, if the box is where the atom is. The atom was not in the box before you observed it to be there. And Heisenberg had this to say. These are Werner Heisenberg's words. But the atom or elementary particles are not real. They form a world of potentialities or possibilities rather than one of facts or things or facts. Let's look at the Bell inequality. If you have a quantum object that has a spin, then you can choose to measure the spin in any given direction. And what you'll find is that whatever direction you choose, that spin is going to be either up or down. By up, I mean if it's spinning like this, the axis points up. If it's spinning like that, the axis points down. So you, have a, you actually have two particles that are entangled with each other. And I'll tell you in a second why we have two instead of one. So one of them flies off in one direction. I choose to measure its spin, say, in this direction and call that direction A. So I measure that. Now, there are also two other directions I could, me could measure, uh, B and C. They're arbitrary. I can choose them in any, any way I want to, but there are two other possible directions I could measure. But having measured this one direction, quantum theory says I can't measure the second one. But I can measure the second one indirectly because if the two particles were entangled, its partner over here is guaranteed to have the opposite spin. Sometimes the same, sometimes the opposite, depending on which, which, which kind of particle you choose. But let's assume it's exactly the opposite spin. Now I can make a measurement on this one in some other direction, some second direction, call it B, and I know then that if I measure this one to be in that direction, then this one over here would be in this one, the opposite direction. So I've determined two directions for this particle over here by virtue of a direct measurement and by virtue of a measurement of its partner in a different direction. So I can write out these probabilities. The probability of measuring, probability of measuring, say, spin up in direction A and spin down in direction B is the probability of measuring spin up in direction A, down in direction B, plus in direction C, which I don't know, which I never measured, and again, the, plus the probability of spin up being positive in A, a down in B, and in the other direction in C. And as you, with a little bit of mathematical manipulation, you can show that this plus that equals that one plus something. And the fact of the matter is that something is positive. It's always got to be positive. You can't have negative probabilities. Therefore, this equation leads to an inequality, that the spin in this direction A and direction B, plus the spin in direction B and C, it has to be greater than or equal to the spin in direction AC. So this is the Bell inequality. This is what's predicted if particles have an intrinsic spin before you look at them. Now, as it turns out, quantum physics has a, uh, a rule that says that if you take the spins in two different directions, now this is the, this is the formula that tells you what the probability is of finding um, the, uh, if you have a whole distribution of particles, finding some fraction of them separated by some angle theta. As it turns out, if you put this formula into the Bell inequality, the Bell inequality is violated. The Bell inequality is not true. And the Bell inequality is based upon the idea that spin is something that's intrinsic, that's, that's not dependent upon your measuring it, but it's there all along. And you just choose to measure it. So it's there when the particles were were joined together when they were made to fly apart. There's the, 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 the spins in the different directions are inherent to the particles. And when you choose to measure over here, that's fine. And this one's going to be um, uh, an anti, what's going to be in the opposite direction uh, for any given spin because they were, they were entangled here. But really, those spins belong to the particles. And your measurement is, is like a classical thing. You look at something objectively and you measure what it is. But in fact, the fact that the Bell inequality is violated and the quantum rule is followed implies that that spin is not really there until you make it happen. The spin in a given direction is created by your deciding to measure that direction, and then that requires that its partner will be the, in the opposite direction for that spin measurement and have its own angle of spin in a different direction, which then this one would have. So the Bell inequality is telling us, or the violation of the Bell inequality is telling us that it's the observation that's creating the reality. Now, as it turns out, um, the Bell inequality could be violated and quantum physics could stay intact if you allowed particles to communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. 
Now this would violate special relativity, but quantum mechanics would still be left intact, and the notion that there is an underlying reality would be left intact if you allowed particles to communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. Well, as it turns out, the Leggett inequality sort of takes away the last amount of freedom, the last degree of freedom that was still left over in the Bell inequality that I was just talking about. And this is a, a diagram of the Leggett inequality taken from New Scientist magazine. And it's a fairly complicated one in that you're not measuring simply uh, a spin here and a spin there from entangled particles. You're taking entangled particles, measuring a spin here, a spin there, and then you're measuring three elliptical polarization angles. And I don't want to go into that in part because it would be way above the level of this talk, and secondly, because I don't fully understand this yet, because this has not been clarified in any qualitative way in the article in New Scientist, nor in the, uh, anything I've, I've found since that has given me an adequate explanation for what, this, what the details of this are. But the point is that it's been hailed as the, both by the, the group in Vienna that made the measurement at my New Scientist magazine, as pretty much ruling out not only non-locality, but also realism, as a, uh, an explanation for how particles can be correlated with each other, and yet quantum mechanics predicts that the relationships between these measurements that you make are rather different quantum mechanically than they are if you assume that the particles could communicate with each other, or that they would be if the particles really have these properties, and you're simply measuring them, but you're not creating anything when you make the measurement, you're making a real objective measurement. So recent experiments led by the group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation, the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. So as they say in, in the magazine, rather than passively observing it, we in fact create reality. Now, if quantum theory denies a the straightforward physical reality of atoms, it would also seem to deny the straightforward physical reality of chairs, which are made of atoms. Now, we like to think that the world can be divided into quantum and classical realms. And in fact, that's sort of the way physics operates practically. But in fact, there really is you know, only one reality here. And the transition from quantum to macro reality is not, not a real one. In fact, it's not not even really blurry. It's, there's one continuous law of physics you know, that takes us from one level to the other. You can have quantum obje objects that are very large. For example, there is a, a gravitational wave detecting bar that weighs about a ton that has to be analyzed using quantum mechanics because of the, the precision of what you're looking for and the precision of knowledge of the, 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 um, the, the, the well, of that bar itself. So a quantum object is not necessarily one that's tiny. It can be a huge thing the size of a, well, a one-ton uh, barbell. Prior to the Leggett experiment, it was thought that observation of one object can instantaneous influence the behavior of another object. Another one is greatly distant, even though physical force connects the two. Well, it's even more mysterious now because what these experiments are telling us, the Leggett experiments, is that consciousness is creating both realities via observation. Now, the, the last thing that is uh, rather mysterious about quantum physics and this ruling out of the notion that the particles can communicate with each other or that there is some realism in the particles that we're measuring rather than being created at the point of measurement, at the moment of measurement, is that the observation also creates a back history. It's possible for objects to say, this is a, a Wheeler time delay experiment that I'm thinking of, if you let a, say, uh, a quantum object encounter a, with an effectively a beam splitter where it can be divided and go along two possible paths, then there are two things that can happen. If the object splits in half and goes along two paths, then it's possible that these two paths, when the objects emerge, will interfere with each other and you will get an interference pattern. And so if you get an interference pattern, then you know that the object has been split at some point and gone off along two parallel paths and therefore, uh, this shows the interference pattern that, that is a signature of that having happened. The alternative is that the particle can go along one path or the other, and you can then detect which path it emerges from when you make your measurement. But whether, you, whether the particle goes along one path, splits, and then along both of them and interferes, or whether it goes along a path, doesn't split, but goes along A or B, that de depends upon what measurement you make down here. 
So you determine down here when you make the measurement what the particle does back here when it reaches the beam splitter. Well, in fact, what you've done is sort of create a backwards in time causation because the object has to do what you measure. If you decide to detect which slit the object comes out of, then it's not possible for that object to have split in two back here because that's not consistent with what you measure. If you make a measurement that gets an interference pattern, then that demonstrates that the object has gone along two paths after it's gone through the beam splitter, but the object did that back here. And it's possible for you to not make your decision on which measurement you're going to make until after the object has passed that point of no return. So once again, it's the observation that creates the reality and in fact even creates the back history for that reality. So the point of all of this is that it certainly looks as if there's evidence coming out of the physics lab, not for God, but for the notion that consciousness is creating reality at the level of quantum physics. And if it's creating reality at the level of quantum physics, then by implication, the rest of reality somehow also is being created by consciousness. And I think consciousness is actually the, the formative element behind the universe. It's not that somehow it's an epiphenomenon coming out of our brains, not a matter of biochemistry taking place in here, but rather it's consciousness that is the ultimate reality out of which everything else has come. And that is my explanation for why the universe is finely tuned. It's not certainly a proof by any means. If you want to go away from this talk thinking there is a multiverse of universes and ours is not special, we're just one of an ensemble, that's fine. It's equally logical, it's equally rational, but I don't think it has any advantage over the notion that it's consciousness all the way behind the universe. Thank you. Okay, we have a nice long time for questions. Um, and, uh, okay, I'll start with the guy I saw first. My name is Kenny Arnett. I'm wondering what happens on a lifeless planet to quantum mechanics, where there is no consciousness around. Never having been on, on a lifeless planet, I don't know. Um, you've, raised a good qu you've raised a question, though, that, that, that I think deserves an answer. Let me open up my computer again, because after all, I've got about a couple of minutes of extra time because I went early, didn't I? So, let's see if I can find a slide here that I prepared as a possible response to a question that might have come up like that. The von Neumann chain. The question is, do you really need an observer, or can, can anything and anything that interacts with a quantum situation constitute a measurement. And this question was looked at rather carefully back in 1932 already by John von Neumann. John von Neumann was a mathematical genius. He was one of the people that invented the, the operator analysis of quantum mechanics, and the operator, operator formalism of quantum mechanics. And uh, what he showed was that quantum theory makes physics encounters with consciousness inevitable. So he considered an apparatus, a measuring apparatus, like a Geiger counter, and he said, okay, now that Geiger counter, whether it goes off or not, let's see for a second here. Ah, he takes a measuring apparatus that would look at whether or not, say, um, uh, a quantum event is happening in a given box, and you could argue, well, that Geiger counter's measurement is really equivalent to an observer looking at that. And the Geiger counter, of course, is not conscious. So can a Geiger counter substitute for a human being? His answer was no. What happens is that the Geiger counter's, the Geiger counter's state becomes, becomes entangled with the state of the, the quantum situation it's trying to measure. If you then try to put a detector to measure whether the Geiger counter has registered or not, then that detector becomes entangled with, becomes superimposed with, quantum mechanically, with a Geiger counter, the detector with a Geiger counter, the Geiger counter with a quantum object, and the whole thing forms a chain. And the chain is not broken until a conscious observer decides to make a measurement. And I see a hand going up in the back there. It's probably going to challenge that interpretation. But this von Neumann chain is the, the explanation, or the rationalization, or the rationale, I should say, I suppose more realistically, the rationale for why it really takes an observer to make a quantum event happen and to break the, uh, well, to bring, bring about the decoherence of the state. Dick Schaup. Um, let me just give um, another um, viewpoint on all this that we've talked about many times um, before, just so it's on the floor. 
I think uh, the um, uh, conclusions being jumped to in the New Scientist article and a lot of other places are just naive and um, there's an awful lot of confusion about all this. So let me give you my viewpoint and you can react. Sure. Um, two entangled particles take off in different directions. Um, they are in a state that's no less real than anything with a simple up or down spin. They're in a very definite state that's a superposed state. And in a, in a Hilbert space, that's just a vector at 45 degrees rather than at zero or 90 degrees, exactly as determined or and exactly as real uh, as anything else. It's just not in on our basis. It's in a definite state of superposition. Now, it is true that when you measure that interaction, changes it to be in an up state or a down state in a, in a binary system. Um, but consciousness, in my view, has nothing whatsoever to do with it, and von Neumann is simply wrong about this. Um, so the leap that I would object to is the one that says um, these phenomena, which you've pretty much correctly described, uh, imply that the consciousness creates the universe. Um, reality that's being discussed is a very naive um, definition of reality, uh, I would say, and um, our interactions do have something to do with what happens in the universe, obviously. Um, but it's all out there, and it's real, whether we interact with it or not. And the interactions that are involved in quantum measurement are a lot more uh, uh, prosaic than, than uh, are sometimes portrayed. Thanks. Well, it's certainly something we're not going to settle here because it's a very deep issue. I'd like to point out, though, that the, the notion that you have a spin that objectively exists and that you simply measure out here that sort of runs afoul of the idea, or the, the, the fact, I should say, that whenever, regardless of which direction you choose to measure the spin in, it's going to be a one-half h-bar. It's going to be either up or down. It's not going to be at some angle. You're not going to measure some fraction of one-half h-bar, or h-bar, whichever the spin is, is of the particle. So it's not, it's, it's, you are creating a reality here when you make a measurement because the, the object would not know that you're going to measure in this direction, therefore it has to be aligned this way. It can't be that way or that way because you're always going to measure either an up or a down. You're never going to measure a fraction of that. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, I have a question about whether you've begun to connect these theories with human identity, you know, who we are in relationship to the quantum world and how we relate to one another. <laughs> well, in, in the book, The Guy Theory, I do make some suggestions along those lines. I mean, that's not the, the point of this talk. I didn't want to preach about my metaphysics of God, but since you asked the question, I'll, I'll say a sentence or two about that. I think that basically it's the, the rationale behind the universe is that there's a consciousness that created the universe because that consciousness wanted to experience what it's like to live in that universe as you, as me, as the animals, as the plants, as whatever aliens exist in the Andromeda galaxy. The point of it is to create a, a universe in which life can arise following the laws of Darwinian evolution. Good point. Darwinian evolution is a key a aspect of this. Life can evolve, and that consciousness can experience its potential, which is the experience that we're having right here in this room now, in part. So that's my metaphysical interpretation. What, how it relates to quantum physics at any level deeper than what I've said here today, I wouldn't know. And this is my, my attempt to show that quantum physics, at least if, if it... Quantum physics cannot prove the existence of God, cannot do that, but it does certainly point to the idea that consciousness is a, is a key element in the creation of reality, and with, with uh, apologies to Dick Schaub. How does perception affect the consciousness of reality? It, in the equation of consciousness creating reality, how does perception affect it? Well, I You're standing on your head, is it spin up or down? I'm taking perception as being the, what consciousness does in the making of the measurement process. I mean, that's part of consciousness. And the conscious, consciousness being active in this process, making an observation is perception. I don't understand the question beyond that. It's spin, it's spinning whichever way you choose to measure it. If you choose to measure the spin in this direction, it's going to be either up or down. It's not going to be some fraction of that. It's going to be either up or down. Very mysterious. You know, this is not what you think. If you spin, take, take a globe, you know, spinning around its axis, and you tilt it in various directions, if you choose to measure its spin in, say, this direction, but it's spinning in that one, you'll get some fractional 
some fractional value for what the projection of the, uh, this axis is on that one. But you make a quantum spin measurement, it's always going to be up or down. Regardless of which direction you measure, you get to choose. <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, like, if there is a crowd of people and there's a rock in the center or something and everybody's looking at it, if someone looked away, it, the rock wouldn't disappear. So, it's like you have to have no one watching something for it, like, kind of for not to really be there? Does that make sense? Well, Einstein asked that same sort of question because Einstein didn't much care for quantum physics. And so he asked one of his colleagues, well, do you really think the moon is not there when you don't look at it? And he, was, he really didn't like quantum physics. But as it turns out, Einstein was proven wrong because the Bell inequality demonstrated that the einstein uh, podolsky rosen paradox was indeed mistaken, and so was Einstein. Now, you know, the question of whether things d are not there when we're not looking, I wouldn't want to go that far. I mean, clearly, that's, that's naive. That doesn't happen. Though at the quantum level, at the quantum level, it certainly seems, seems to happen because things don't actually get put in their proper place until you make the measurement. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm forced to say that there's a mystery here when you try to extrapolate this to our, this, the state of the universe and the state of, of ourselves, a mystery that we'll just have to live with, but it certainly points that way. Unfortunately, I, I'm sure there were a lot more interesting questions, but we're all out of time, so thank you, Bernie. Thank you.